So next up, we have Anna Slater. Um, so yeah, very, very grateful, very happy to be introducing Anna today. Um, I guess, uh, I think I first met Anna when uh, you, you came to Steve Lay's group for a short while to do some flow chemistry with us way back in the early 2010s, I think. Um, but Anna is a Royal Society URF and a senior lecturer at the University of Liverpool. And her interests are broadly in the area of supramolecular chemistry, molecular materials, self-assembly and organic synthesis and how you can use enabling technologies to, to kind of uh, enhance all of these things. Um, she got her PhD from the University of Nottingham in 2011, did a couple of postdocs, Nottingham and then Liverpool. And then in 2016, she received a Royal Society EPSRC Dorothy Hodgkin Fellowship and then, is, then followed it up very successfully with a uh, Royal Society Fellowship in 2021. So um, without taking any more of your time, uh, I will invite you to uh, start your talk, Anna. Thank you very much, Ben. I hope you can see my screen okay yes. and hear me. Excellent. You can see and can hear you. Perfect. Thank you very much. And, and yeah, thank you for the, the reminder of uh, um, we are my first uh, introductions to flow chemistry in, in Steve Lay's lab as uh, supported by the, the Dialer Molecule Network to, to, to go and make that visit and really learn about flow chemistry. So again, it's, it's just a really test, a real testament to the, the power of that network of how it's, it's, we've been, it's still playing in, in all of our research today. Um, so yeah, apologies uh, slightly for the slightly esoteric title. Uh, it was just trying to summarize all of the different things that we do. Um, and thank you very much for the invitation to come and speak to you today. It's easy to feel like a bit of an interloper. Uh, I would describe myself as uh, an enthusiastic and grateful beneficiary of catalysis research um, used in small molecule synthesis, but we don't really work in, in, in that space. Uh, I'm a super molecular chemist as Ben has said, but I'm very lucky to be working, if I can get my slides to move, there we go. Um, with some wonderful colleagues uh, in, this, in the Department of Chemistry in the Materials Innovation Factory uh, at Liverpool. And I thought I would just briefly mention um, some of the opportunities there as well. Um, the Materials Innovation Factory is a, is a concentration of equipment and expertise on high throughput screening and automation as well. Um, and there are groups working within catalysis in that space. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about that because uh, if you wanted to talk on that, then I would have uh, recommended one of my one of my colleagues. Um, but there are ways to access this facility as well, either as part of clustered grants or through collaboration with those of us at Liverpool who have um, NIF credits. So if you are interested in, in the analytical and um, high throughput equipment there, then do feel free to get in touch with that as well. But really what, what I'm interested in is supramolecular chemistry and some of the tools we can use to make supramolecular chemistry do what we want as opposed to what, it, what happens uh, when, you, when you try a supramolecular experiment. Um, so this is our wonderful research group down here uh, and we work on a range of different sub, uh, substrates and problems um, ranging from the fundamental of how can we make cages in the shape that we like all the way up to the applied where we're working with our industrial partners such as Vitrex to optimize some of their processes by switching from batch to flow. Really how, you, how I like to sell this or how I like to summarize this is that how you make something matters, process matters. We've already heard some amazing examples of that in the first speaker uh, for uh, Lee from, our, uh, from this session. Um, and I don't really need to tell chemical engineers or process engineers that process matters, uh, but sometimes you'd be surprised at how often that's forgotten. Um, so we like to develop tools to influence what happens in our processes for discovery, control and understanding. We do flow chemistry as part of this, but we also do an awful lot of standard and batch synthesis too. So to give you a little bit more insight into what sort of systems we're looking at, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with supermolecular chemistry, so I thought I would just do a, a very quick overview of, of what we care about in this area. Um, we're talking about systems that exploit weak, often reversible, non-covalent interactions in either the way that you make them, the synthesis or their application, and sometimes both. So you will, I'm sure, all be familiar with the seminal work of Cram, Pearson and Lane, um, for which the Nobel Prize was awarded. Um, looking at crown ethers, for example, as host guest systems, and here is a curcubitral uh, acting as a host for a neutral molecule. It's a huge, broad field that I love. Uh, I couldn't possibly cover all the different uh, strands of supermolecular chemistry, but I've tried to summarize some of the applications and some of the uses that people are developing these systems for. So hosts for guests being one example, but also binding sites with substrates and artificial enzymes, supermolecular catalysis is a huge and growing field, self-assembled materials for various different applications, 
applications, pollutant cleanup, drug delivery, separations and CO2 sequestration. But I think it's fair to say that we haven't seen very many examples. There are some key examples, but there aren't very many examples where these are used on a large scale or used in, in real world applications. And I think that's partly because they're a bit difficult to make actually, um, particularly at scale. And part of the reason for that is that when you're using weak and reversible interactions, your environment matters a whole lot. The conditions that you're using matter a whole lot. So that can make it very challenging to get robust processes scalable processes just to make enough of what you need. But if you're a super molecular chemist and you're thinking, I want to make a particular host for a certain guest, or I want to make a particular super molecular system, then what are the strategies you can use to get there? So of course, if you're trying to design and make the perfect molecular host, multi-step synthesis is, a very ex is an excellent way to get to pretty complicated hosts. Uh, I'm an organic chemist by training, a synthetic chemist by training. Uh, and I love organic synthesis, but it can be a little bit difficult if you're doing multiple steps to your final product to say that this is this is scalable or, or this is easy to do. Um, so often what you'll see people doing is exploiting systems under thermodynamic control. So where your product is a thermodynamically most stable option for all of those different parts to assemble into, and you exploit reversible chemistry to get there, and that makes your life a lot easier. You can also do iterative design, of course. Every time we make a new molecule, we learn something about how good it is at its application, and then we learn from that, we learn design rules from that. And we've, we will hear, I'm sure, uh, we've already heard some examples of how high throughput screening and automation technology can allow us to explore a really large range of different options um, in supermolecular, for example, looking for new guests or new hosts. Um, and of course, that's all underpinned uh, by computational modeling, which increasingly can give us more information about where we should be looking, what materials will be useful for the application that we have. Um, and my particular area is using flow chemistry in this, in this sense as well, to get a bit more control over what's going on. So really getting down to brass tacks now, if you're in the lab, those are the strategies you can use. What are, what are you actually going to change to, to make those strategies work? And apologies. Uh, I mean, if you've seen me talk recently, you've heard this metaphor before. I'm still working on it. Um, if you're searching for super molecular treasure, what can you use to control what you get? And of course, the starting point for a lot of us and for myself as well is the molecules that you use to make your super molecular system. Uh, so the ingredients, if you like. And you can start playing with the geometry of those precursors, the reactivity of those precursors, how they connect to each other, how rigid they are, how flexible they are. And just to give you one very quick example, here's a, uh, here's a paper we, we published a couple of years ago now, where we're using different aldehyde starting materials that have different angles between the two end groups, if you like, the, the reactive sites, uh, which when reacted with the diamine form differently shaped cages, which then have different pores, which can interact differently with guests. Of course, if you then wanted to build those up into a material by using weak interactions between them, um, you can start playing with the strength and directionality of the interactions between those individual blocks to make a porous substrate. Uh, in this case, we care about porosity. So here's one of these dyes, um, which was uh, TCC1. If you just make a solid precipitate from, from this cage simply by adding an antisolvent, you can crystallize it into a material which has this packing motif. So it has uh, the windows are not connected, right? If you imagine the windows at the top and the bottom. However, if you take this cage and it's enantiomer simply by reacting it with an S-diamine, you can form this packing motif in the solid state. So R cage only does this, R and S cage, now you have a connected pore simply by very small tweaks in that interaction strength. So that's not what I'm talking about today. That's our sort of ingredients approach. What about the process? The process matters a lot. And here, you'll be thinking about a lot of different parameters. You'll be thinking about how fast your components are mixing. What solvent are you in? What's the polarity of that solvent? What's the solubility of all your process, of your constituent parts? You'll be thinking about concentration and concentration gradients. You'll be thinking about temperature. You might be thinking about the order in which things are added, because that can make a huge difference. And of course, you'll be thinking about time. You might be thinking about a whole host of other important parameters, relative humidity, for example, might make a difference. Sometimes you'll get the control over those parameters by using a round bottom flask. And if you do, you should use a round bottom flask. You know, they're pretty easy to handle. They have lots of benefits in that way. 
a classic uh, technique in supermolecular chemistry is slow addition of one reagent to another, right? So you're controlling the concentration of these things over time. Um, and that's typically done by a syringe pump. And that can really help improve the yield of a macrocycle, for example, by using high dilution conditions. Sometimes you'll get even better control, and I'll show you an example of that later, by going to a fully continuous process. And that's really my central ethos is sometimes you need more control and flow can give you that control. So if you use all of these techniques, what, what's your prize? What's the treasure that you get? Well, you might improve your yield. We've seen some examples of that already. You might improve your selectivity for your desired product or get a different selectivity for something new, which could also be interesting. You might influence your assembly pathway in your supermolecular assembly process, which could give you a completely different structure, similar example to this sort of thing here, which then gives you a different function for your material. So again, you're getting more out of your system, you're understanding it better, you're getting more control, uh, and that's really what we're aiming for here. Uh, here's one example of how small changes allows us to target, in this case, a pore that isn't so symmetrical as these pores, so slightly lower symmetry. And here we're using self-sorting to go for a particular structure which has this a, a differently shaped pore than was previously accessible as an example of a function that we've targeted. So in this talk, I'm going to give you an example where atline analysis and flow chemistry has helped us optimize the synthesis of a macrocycle um, and where actually closing the loop and automating that process would help even more. I'm then going to give a bit of a direction of travel for our work on more complicated systems where we don't understand the chemistry quite so well uh, and point out here that analytical methods are, are really critical to be able to do these sorts of automated optimization in flow chemistry. And then I'm going to very briefly, if I have time, talk about something we've been getting into more recently that is even more complicated. And this is non-thermal plasma being used for chemical reactivity and how flow can help us there as well. Um, so you can begin to see where my esoteric title comes from. I'm not going to give a big introduction to flow chemistry that's already been covered really well. Um, I, there are a few key things that I need you to know that we can do in flow to explain the example that I'm, um, that I'm going to be talking to you today about. Um, the one of the first things I always do uh, when somebody joins the group is I give them this uh, review from Peter Seeberger's group from 2017, The Hitchhiker's Guide to Flow Chemistry, partly because I'm a huge Douglas Adams fan, it reminds me not to panic, but also because it has a lots of really excellent, uh, it's, a, it's a great summary of what flow can do uh, in a variety of different areas, um, going from the fundamentals all the way up to uh, how automation is starting to shape this field as well. I'd also really recommend this one from Klaus Jensen's group, deciding whether to go with the flow, uh, puns are mandatory in flow chemistry, uh, where you can perhaps look at, there's some key parameters you can look at to understand whether your process in batch will have an improvement or might have an improvement by moving to flow. And then just to, to plug this work of it, a really excellent undergraduate student, Katie Ollerton, who uh, came to our, our group in, during the pandemic and wasn't allowed to go in the lab because of lockdown, uh, she worked with um, my excellent former colleague, now Imperial colleague, um, Becky Greenaway, uh, to write this review on how enabling technologies such as high throughput screening and flow chemistry is being used or has been used in supermolecular chemistry and where we think it might be going. So please do feel free to check that work out as well. The things I need you to know for these examples are we can heat solvents above their boiling point because we are under pressure uh, and that will help us in the example I'm going to show you. We can also use that to telescope re reaction steps with rapid changes in temperature. So you can heat, which is hard to do in batch, right? If you ramp up temperature in batch, you'll have a lag time. And we can use inline or atline analysis to understand our process more and learn some more about the selectivity, which we can then feed back into improving the reaction. So here is my example after all that preamble. Uh, this is Dr. Chris Jones. He joined the group uh, back in 20. 19 um, and he had brought some supermolecular treasure with him which he'd found working in John Steed's group for his PhD in Durham. He had uh, been reacting isocyanates with um, ethylamine, uh, so chloroethylamine or bromoethylamine and discovered that he made rather than the linear system he was expecting these two macrocycles in a roughly 50-50 ratio in, in the reaction. Um, so you can see that these have lots of interesting heteroatoms, maybe some interesting binding behavior. Um, and you can see when you, you crystallize them really quite nicely, they crystallize beautifully, these systems. They have some intramolecular hydrogen bonds here, which holds these sections rigid. 
They don't bind very much. He did a lot of binding titrations to see if they would do that sort of host guest chemistry I was talking about earlier. But they actually do something that I think is really intriguing. Um, in solution, they interconvert between this syn form and this antiform here. They act like a little clamp. They have closed and open geometries. Uh, so for me, from a supermolecular chemistry perspective, I think that's really cool. If you can trap something and release it controllably, you could think of this as part of a molecular machine or as part of a responsive material. So these are quite really quite interesting. There aren't many very rigid macrocycles that have this huge, this very well-defined conformational change. But there's kind of a problem, and I alluded to it earlier. You make both of these. Now, if you want a nicely defined change, you don't want one part of your system where these two rings are offset and another one where they're over the top of each other. You really just want this guy here, uh, two, this macrocycle two, where if you added some functionality here, it would be where, where you needed it to be. So before we can use this uh, in any kind of system, we need to optimize this for selectivity for macrocycle two. We also need to optimize its yield as well. I'll get onto that in a minute. So how does the synthesis work? Chris put in an awful lot of work in understanding this uh, and characterizing loads of intermediates. But essentially, it boils down to this. You start with your isocyanate, diisocyanate. You add your bromo or chloroethylamine uh, in with a bit of triethylamine in chloroform, and you form this. You do this addition. This will then cyclize to form intermediate five, which can then react with itself because you have this amine here to form macrocycle one. However, if at this point of the reaction, you add a second equivalent and have another addition, you form this key intermediate 4A for chloro, 4B for bromo, which will then undergo the cyclization twice. And then it can interact with another, react with another equivalent of your isocyanate to form macrocycle two. Now, uh, the sharp-eyed among you will say, there's an easy way to bias the formation of the system to macrocycle two, and that is to use two equivalents of your amine, right? Um, and that exactly works, right? It works to a certain extent. Uh, so the one pot method where you've got a one to one ratio, 20 degrees, six hours, you get roughly about the same of one and two. Whereas if you start with a two to one ratio of your um, chloro or bromo uh, with your isocyanate, you form six and then you can add your extra equivalent. So here's the selectivity for method B here. And you can see when you use the chloro, you get a nearly 100% selectivity for macrocycle two. So that's great until you look at this graph over here and you notice that your total conversion is in the two to 3% range, which is not so great. So of course, you can increase the temperature of this process and you get a yield of up to, a conversion of up to 76% at 60 degrees, but then your selectivity falls off a cliff because you're accelerating both the addition and, and the cyclization. And you can only go to a certain ceiling in our round bottom flask because of the boiling point of your solvent. So we want to improve both yield and selectivity. How can flow help? Well, this is the uh, method B in flow form, essentially, that Chris uh, eventually, after much persuasion that he did like flow chemistry, uh, set up. Where you have your two to one ratio here uh, of, your, of your amine and your isocyanate, you pass it through this first coil, T1, which is held at a lower temperature, and then you add your equivalent of isocyanate when you have optimized the production of your key intermediate six. At this point, you can really crank up the temperature because you've already done both your additions and then you ideally get your selectivity for macrocycle two. We're under pressure here, we've got a back pressure regulator so we can elevate the temperature quite a lot higher than we can in batch. And we have this switching valve here, which has a nanoliter channel, uh, which can uh, automatically send aliquots to this atline UPL CMS, which is triggered by a simple contact closure and some basic uh, Python code. So, Looking at just the conversion, you can see that if you increase T1, you get, you get a slight increase, but not very much. Whereas if you increase the temperature of the second coil, um, you get a really large increase in your conversion all the way up to 90 or so. So we're happy. What about selectivity? Well, your selectivity if you increase T1 falls off a cliff, but, you do, but for T2, you do see a reduction in your selectivity as you increase that temperature. But there's a nice point where your yield is high and your selectivity is not too diminished. And you can then do re uh, simple recrystallization to clean this all the way up to macrocycle two. Looking at what the inline analysis tells us, take your time. Uh, if, you, if you look at T1 at 50 degrees, what you're looking for are these key intermediates here. We want as much six as is possible and its precursor four. So six is just here. You can see, you see the signal for six here. It's, you see a more here at 70 degrees, uh, but at 
but the point you get to 100 degrees, you're starting to see more of intermediate five coming through at the end of T1, uh, which means that you're starting to lose your selectivity. And you can also see overalkylation, such as this intermediate here, um, eight at this higher temperature. So we understand why we can't go any higher. So at this point, we have our optimal conditions, T1 of 70, T2 of 90, your yield is tripled and your selectivity is above 80%. And now we can um, hook this up with our auto sampler and plonk a diff load of different amines. Uh, we're doing that at the moment um, to get a whole range of macrocycles, which may have more controlled switching behavior and potentially antimicrobial activity, which is being tested by our colleagues over in health and life sciences. We spent a lot of time doing these experiments. They don't take very long individually, but you can see there are lots of individual points that he's done here. What we would also like to do is close this loop where we are automatically detecting peaks of interest and then the, the instrument is then uh, automatically seeking this optimum uh, and we're working with Rich Bourne's lab in Leeds to achieve this uh, in, the next, in the near future. That's the sort of well understood chemistry, we understand that chemistry, so I'm just going to very briefly tell you about some things that we are doing uh, next. Um, I'm very interested in reversible chemistry and flow to make these nice thermodynamically stable uh, cages, for example, but also to tune that we have multiple possibilities. Can you do, can you select a kinetic product, for example? Um, so I just wanted to briefly point out some work that is ongoing in the lab at the moment where your chemistry starts with being reversible. And then of course, when you oxidize, you make it something that's useful. So this is an example of formation of porphyrins. Uh, which is work currently being undertaken by Dr. Fagdas Parvin, who was at Imperial College of Nunes, uh, Nunes Group uh, before joining us, and Henry Morris, who is just about to submit his PhD thesis, where we're optimizing the synthesis of porphyrins and detecting their formation by uh, at line uh, UV vis here, uh, collecting, uh, detecting the, the key serret band in that. So looking forward to being able to talk a bit more about that in the future. Um, but we do also have many other people within the group who are working on reversible chemistries to make, for example, macrocycles and cages based on this work, which was done in collaboration with Steve Lowe's group uh, and when I was in Andy's group as a postdoc uh, to make these cages in high yield in short amounts of time using flow chemistry. But here, it's really key to understand the system. So the macrocycles that Abby's working on, they are made, made of very simple starting materials, but they have about four or five possible products. So what we've been spending time on doing is understanding their solution phase behavior. She's co-supervised by Becky Greenaway Imperial, uh, where we've really had to use DOZI, IMS, complex uh, NMR and mass spectrometry to really know what's going on before we can start optimizing uh, the selection of, of one particular product over another. I've talked very briefly and I appreciate it very quickly uh, on how we've been using uh, LCMS and also UV uh, to detect and optimize products. We're now developing, uh, we've got uh, an IR and an, in a benchtop NMR as well, so we can expand the systems that we're looking at. Um, and as I said, we really want to start closing the loop on these processes, looking more at the kinetics of these processes. Uh, and once we have these um, systems in place, we, have, we want to apply it to a range of different systems. Uh, very briefly wanted to also mention uh, some work that is relevant to catalysis, which was carried out uh, in collaboration with my, my wonderful colleague, Professor Zhang Lang Xiao, and the postdoc, uh, fantastic postdoc in his group, Dr. Xu Lang Huang, uh, where they had this really intriguing reaction where you, you take polystyrene, I mean simply plastic plates essentially, dissolve them up in a solvent and expose them to toluene sulfonic acid and UV LEDs, uh, and, and oxygen, and you can degrade this into valuable chemicals that come out literally as a lovely crystalline powder. So they had developed this process and understood it pretty well, um, but what we wanted was to scale it up. Now there's a problem when you want to scale up a photochemical reaction because you have, you're limited by the light penetration into your, your batch vessel, whereas in flow when you're working in a narrow pipe, your, the penetration of your light is very much more much better and then to scale you can run your process for longer. Uh, so uh, we were very grateful for a loan of an additional e-series from Vapotech to situate this in Professor Zhao's lab and Xi uh, learned learnt chemistry in three months and carried out all of this optimization work to get to this optimized process where you have your polystyrene and your solvent going in here, you have your oxygen with a mass flow controller being fed in here into one of the Vapotech um, UV150 photochemical reactors and we were then able to um, scale this up uh, to a 20 gram scale, uh, demonstrating at least part of the process to scale up, although I appreciate that 20 grams is not 20 kilos. Just very last. Just say, thing. Two minute warning, Anna. 
Thank you, Ben. I am, I've got about two minutes to go, so that's fantastic. Um, the very last thing I wanted to very briefly mention is some work that um, has been led by Patricia Roskowska, a PhD student in our group, collaboration with James Walsh, who is a plasma physicist, uh, Johnny Hyam, who does uh, particle tracking in flow, Tim Eason, who's an ultrafast spectroscopist, um, and Abby, who's doing some of the chemistry in our, in our group, where we're looking at the reactivity of non-thermal plasma. Now, Non-thermal plasma is a really interesting state of matter where it is room temperature, pretty much a little bit elevated temperature, but has high energy electrons. Um, and this could be used and has been used for some uh, chemical transformations. Uh, there have been examples of oxidation, dehalogenation, that kind of thing. Um, but there are some challenges in using this as a reagent. Even in very short lived, you, here is a, a helium plasma mixing with water you get an extremely complex radical profile, uh, which could do some interesting chemistry, but is very, very hard to understand. This means it's very poorly understood. It's hard to track what's going on. Um, the in the literature, not all the parameters that you need to generate the plasma are always reported, so it's hard to make comparisons. And when you're exposing a liquid to a large gas flow, then you get evaporation problems. And all these essentially mean reactivity is observed, but it's not yet explained. Um, it's also mostly in aqueous systems because of this problem of, of evaporation. So what Patricia did was uh, she um, designed and prototyped this um, microfluidic system. But what we have here is a non-thermal plasma, which is being met by a stream of this is methylene blue, which is degraded by plasma. So it's a model for uh, reactivity of this plasma. And what we have here is uh, online emission spectroscopy to look at the species that we can detect in here. Uh, these are the kind of readouts you get from this. It's an argon plasma. You can see we've done chloroform, DCM and water. Uh, and we also have a batch rig now where you can compare some of the chemistry you'd see in the microfluidic chip and with the, the batch reactor here. So we've just pre-printed this if you want to know what we've been up to. Um, and we've got some really interesting results with the kinds of reactions I was talking about earlier where we can get things faster and cleaner. Um, but we're always very interested if people would like to try anything with non-thermal plasma, we really are open to suggestions. So please do get in touch if you want to know more. So hopefully I've shown you in that whistle-stop tour of all the things that we do, uh, that flow is good uh, for understanding your process, accessing new structures, improving your yield and selectivity, uh, and really broadening the space you can look at and getting better control over what you can do. Um, we're currently working on implementing that closed loop optimization to apply it not just to synthesis, but also work up in crystallization. And yeah, and we're developing our work in non-thermal plasma synthesis now that we have that rig to play with. Um, we're very open to collaboration. We have a suite of flow reactors and analysis equipment. We very, very welcome anybody who'd like to try it and come and visit us in Liverpool. Uh, and just the last thing to acknowledge, the wonderful people that I work with uh, and the people who very kindly funded us. And thank you for your attention. Brilliant. Thank you, Anna. Uh, amazing talk. Um, I, I did let the time slip a little bit there. So we've got time for a couple of quick questions. Um, if you want to get if you want to answer your ask your questions, get on the chat very quickly. Uh, just a quick one and maybe almost a comment. Uh, I was fascinated by your your supramolecular formation where you had the two coils in series with the different temperatures. That was a really remarkable temperature drop off in the selectivity selectivity drop off at the temperature increase. It'd be really curious to see what the kinetics are doing there yeah me too me too we didn't uh, have an exhaustive look at the kinetics in flow chris did have quite a good look at the kinetics in batch uh that's all in the si of the paper and i think it would take me too long to talk about yeah. it here but yeah yeah we have some yeah. ideas of why that might be but... before i picked up on that i was going to say it, it's like really good really good example to do some design of experiments on and then i saw that drop off and i'm like oh hang on <laughs> be a really awkward system but um uh, yeah amazing work kind of optimizing that thank you uh so natalie's asking what data are you going to need to close the close the loop on the optimization yeah, so um, we, we don't always, it depends on the system, right? So those macrocycles, they have really key, very shifted peaks in the NMR for macrocycle one and two. So that's fantastic. We know how we, we, could, we, can, do, we can do that one. Um, for others, it's not quite so, quite so clear cut. We also struggle. We have um, equipment that is very difficult to get data out of. And often the problem we encounter isn't so much the, anal the analysis, it's getting the output out of the instruments that we have. So uh, yes. We are UV we like because that's that's simple, especially for the porphyrins, nice whacking great peak, you know what you've got. Um, and we know when you've got a protonated porphyrin, for example, and we can see porphyrinogens and we can tell them all apart. And that's lovely because we just have 
a, it's a really simple um, piece, piece of, we're using a unique sys um, UV detector there. Uh, but yeah, it really, it's very system dependent. And I think it's, it, we also lack some of the skills and we've just hired a couple of people who know how to do that, which is great. Uh, but it's, it's really, it's boring problems like hardware. <laughs> other than sometimes. Everyone's having it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. In the interest of time, actually, I might call it there, but I think this is something I'd love to come back on and discuss more with you in the discussion session later. Thank you very much. Sorry for going a bit over. So just uh, no, hey, uh, thank you again for the wonderful talk.